Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm Aisha, your host. Let's continue our series on taking a balanced approach to hadith. In today's episode, we'll explore the idea of validity in hadith. If we say that hadith are sayings of the Prophet, then shouldn't we, as followers of the Sunnah and of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, accept the hadith as we find them? Is this a problematic approach? Let's sit down with Dr. Shabir Ali to guide us through this discussion. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shabir. Pleasure to be on. So when we discussed uh, taking a balanced approach to hadith recently, we talked about in our last segment, we talked about why we cannot reject hadith altogether. So the flip side is, shouldn't we, shouldn't we accept it altogether? So what's your <laughs> take on that? Yeah, so now on the flip <laughs> side, we want to talk about why we cannot accept the hadiths uncritically. Yes. Uh, this has been the approach of Muslims uh, all the way back from to, uh, to the inception uh, of Islamic teachings. We find uh, even within the lifetime of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, there was a man who uh, went to a certain uh, uh, region and he told people that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave me authority over you. And the, the story about this is that uh, he wanted to marry a certain girl who oh. was rejecting <laughs> him. So okay. by passing him <laughs> off as acting on the Prophet's authority, yeah. he was setting himself up to you know there propose you uh, <laughs> and, and not be rejected and when this was uh, reported to the Prophet peace be upon him he re, uh, reneged uh, he, he, he repudiated that man's claim and and so we find that uh, there, there is the kind of checks and balances to make sure we don't just simply accept anything that somebody said that the Prophet peace be upon him said uh, we find among the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that uh, Omar radiallahu an, the, the second caliph of Islam, he, he used to demand of people, bring witnesses if you're claiming that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said something. And uh, he, other companions uh, sometimes rejected what another one said. Uh, because what that person said may not uh, have seemed reasonable. Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, mother of the believers, uh, may Allah be pleased with her, uh, used to reject many sayings that she heard uh, from, from some of the male companions. Uh, sometimes uh, she castigated the sayings as coming from them and mm -hmm. uh, she saw some sayings as reflected a kind of a misogyny that she credited not to the Prophet peace be upon him obviously but to the people who were narrating these uh, statements so she rejected them. Sometimes she found that there are statements which are contrary to what is mentioned clearly in the Quran and, and she would say okay they're saying that but the Quran says this other thing and it is the Quran that obviously rules uh, for, for Muslims if there is an obvious contradiction between what people are narrating that the Prophet peace be upon him said and what the Quran actually says. Uh, taking a, a cue from this, uh, scholars have um, continued to uh, look at hadiths uh, critically like when we, when we think of criticizing people think finding fault. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that could be for a good purpose, as in the case of studying hadiths, because uh, while the Quran, as we've saw, seen in the previous show, while the Quran directs us to follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Quran does not tell us to follow everything that people report about the Prophet, because yeah. some of their reports could be wrong. In fact, in the 49th chapter of the Quran, it specifically uh, says that uh, if uh, an evildoer comes to you with information, then you should verify that information. Uh, now it says evildoer, but Muslim commentators on the Quran have said that re regardless whether evildoer or good doer, anyone can make a mistake. So if somebody comes to you with information, you should verify that information before you start, you know, making a big deal of it. Of course, we we look at things practically because not all information is of such crucial importance, and what the uh, instruction is telling us to do could be a, something very minor. We probably we just want to do it and get over with it rather yeah. than to go into a detailed investigation. So for most people, uh, we, we, if we find a hadith, we presume that this is uh, part of the Islamic heritage and uh, it tells us to do something, we just act upon it. But if it, uh, if it is of crucial importance, it has major implications for society, uh, then it requires some investigation. And so while the average person still may not have the uh, acumen to uh, yeah. to make this investigation for himself or herself, uh, it is uh, incumbent on Muslim scholars today uh, to use all of the available information, all of the empirical knowledge we have, 
uh, to go back and look at the hadiths that have been transmitted down through the ages and ask how much of this is genuinely from the Prophet, peace be upon him, because certainly uh, it's always been accepted and known among Muslim scholars that we cannot accept hadiths uncritically. So obviously scholars have a responsibility and that's, you know, they go in, they do the research, they have the, those skill sets, but what about, uh, you know, the average person? I, I'm also thinking now within the context of social media and, and Google where we have access to Islamic information, um, sometimes it's a lot to take in and it's very easy, like, you know, I've come across sayings of the Prophet which I've never heard of before and so you want to go to the right resources to reference that. So how do you go about that from an average person's perspective? It, it's not easy uh, from the average person's perspective and to, to deal with this as, a, as an issue, uh, many scholars are proposing now that uh, the, the, the scholarly body uh, needs to sift the hadith records one more time and uh, to distill from the current collections of hadiths uh, those ones which uh, the scholars are confident uh, have application for our present uh, circumstances and uh, that could be traced reliably back to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So we need like new collections of, mm -hmm. of hadith. Uh, but uh, until that is produced, and, and obviously it's a massive undertaking, uh, for which we do have the capability, but do people have the willingness? This is another yeah. question. Uh, but w w while we're waiting for such corpuses to be produced, uh, w how does the average person get around or navigate yeah. through these mazes of hadiths that yeah. are there available on the internet? Well, uh, Muhammad Zubair Siddiqui in a book called uh, the Hadith for Beginners, which is uh, sold um, in, in Muslim bookshops, often annexed uh, to mosques. Uh, it gi gives us some guidelines about uh, how to recognize or how to know the kinds of hadiths which are problematic. And, and how do we know these kinds of hadiths? Because historically it has been known that there are people who uh, invented hadiths for some special purposes. Like for example, there are those who invented hadiths for political purposes. I if they wanted to support a certain political leader, uh, mm. they, they invented hadiths that either uh, speak well of that person's locality uh, or that person's trivial lineage or something like this so that one would you know, most likely uh, favor this uh, political pers uh, mm -hmm. uh, figure over somebody else. Yeah. Uh, if uh, sometimes there are uh, hadiths which are demeaning to women, if uh, if if a man wanted to put his wife in her place uh, in his own thinking, uh, he wouldn't tell her directly because she wouldn't listen to him, but he would circulate a saying into the community so that that saying would come back to his wife as a saying of the prophet, not of her husband. So actually, I just want to stop you here. So we're talking about, so, so far we've talked about political categories that we need to be aware of, uh, ones where they demean women. Are there any other categories that we should be wary of? Yes, the scholars, including Muhammad Zubair Siddiqui, have given um, lists of many other types uh, of uh, hadith. Again, uh, and going by the, the general sense of the, the, the ways in which people forged hadiths and for what purposes. They say that there were uh, people with religious inclinations who wanted to encourage people to do good deeds and to stay away from bad deeds. And so they invented hadiths for the purpose. Hadiths encouraging uh, the doing of good deeds by promising great rewards for small deeds. And uh, the contrary also, hadiths promising uh, tremendous punishment for very small misdeeds. Mm -hmm. uh, so they say watch for these hadiths because they, they may not be genuine. They're just inventions by people. Uh, along these lines, there are hadiths that uh, give uh, uh, promised rewards for reciting certain portions of the Quran. And, uh, and so you might have a hadith that says if you recite this passage of the Quran, you get such a great reward. Uh, that, that obviously was for the purpose of encouraging people to read the Quran. Uh, but you have curiously a hadith which to me uh, will encourage people to not to read the Quran because there's a hadith, there's a hadith that says if you read uh, the 112th chapter of the Quran, mm -hmm. that one little chapter which comprises only four verses, you get the reward as if you read the entire Quran, if you read that three times. Awesome, someone would just read so that every obviously day. Obviously, you read <laughs> yeah. that, you don't have to read the rest of, of the Quran, That's you see. True. So it can have the opposite effect, and, and people have done things for good reasons, and some people may have done it for bad reasons, um, including, as we've seen, the political and women demeaning and so on, but uh, more insidious than this, it is known that in the early Muslim communities, uh, there were people who the Quran castigates as munafiqun, hypocrites. 
Uh, so a, a, a hypocrite could have actually invented anything because he is uh, or she is not a genuine Muslim but passes off as a genuine Muslim within the society. They could relate anything for, for good or bad purposes and then it's taken by a genuine Muslim on face value because we don't know what's in the heart of a person. Uh, another category of people has been referred to as Zindiq or the Zanadiqa, people who again were not really Muslims but they are there passing off in the community. Uh, they, they could circulate uh, information, misinformation, in order to mislead others. This is very deliberate. Mm -hmm. And uh, innocent Muslims would take that again at face value and circulate it as though it is genuine information. Moreover, sometimes Muslims themselves uh, could have misconstrued certain actions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and uh, related his actions uh, thinking that they're relating the truth based on their own observation, but they have made an inference which is incorrect and they're passing off that inference as fact uh, without realizing uh, their own error. So as you're talking, I'm thinking of, I, I remembered all hadith within all of those categories. Just briefly as we wrap up, when we look at hadith uh, for now, you know, there are terms like as sahih and etc. So are there some terminology that the average Muslim right now can refer to to say, okay, if I refer back and this is narrated by this, then it's valid if it's not. Uh, un unfortunately, these labels uh, do not uh, give the final uh, indication, though there are actually some indication. Mm -hmm. If a hadith is ca classified as maudu, this means false, obviously rejected, mm -hmm. uh, and generally would not be found in the classical collections uh, of hadith because the scholars have already done a lot of work to uh, remove the most uh, obviously fraudulent yeah. ones. Others have been castigated as weak or daif. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously those are to be avoided. Then uh, going up the scale, some are called hasan, which means good or sound. Even above that, there is uh, some. there are some which are called sahih, mm -hmm. uh, which means authentic. Uh, but uh, something authentic here means that it's absolutely true. It, it was actually said or the thing reported actually happened, but that's not what it means. In hadith terminology, what it means in essence is that it's past certain scholarly verifications. One, that, uh, that the scholars have seen that there is a connected chain of narrators and we trust the narrators. Mm -hmm. And two, that they did not find any fault with the, with the narrative. But the fact that they did not find any fault with the narrative does not mean that there is mean. no fault mm -hmm. with the narrative. We may find a fault later on based on empirical knowledge and so on. So one of the things that the scholars uh, now advise us against is accepting a hadith that uh, goes against empirical knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know something verifiably to be a fact and then the hadith shows you the opposite. Well, somebody may say, well, you know, if God says it, well, then I believe it regardless of what my eyes see. But in the case of hadith, it's not simply that God says it. It's that somebody is reporting that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said this. And it's not only somebody reporting. Somebody reporting that somebody reporting that somebody reporting mm -hmm. that somebody is reporting that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said this. It's a long chain of narrators. Any one of them could have made a mistake along the way. There's more to be said, but we'll leave this for our next episode on sure. the series. So thank you very much, Akshar. You're welcome. Hey YouTube, we hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.